Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to um, to 20th Century Society. We are live this evening from um, South London and the California desert, which is a first for us. Um, John Going um, from Stainer Architects has done a fantastic job on the renovation of the Wave House, which he came to show us. Um, and um, we were hoping that, that Volker Velka, um, a historian who some of you may have remember from his time when he was based here in, in the UK, unfortunately he's had to go and see his father who's ill, so he's not here, but um, but John knows a huge, huge amount about the, the, the house itself and, um, and its architect. And I'm sure um, he will um, give us an excellent um, event. So um, what's going to happen is um, um, John will introduce himself or I'll introduce John and you'll just sort of have a quick look at the, um, the, um, the, the, the setting of the house and the, the, the neighbourhood on his iPad, then he's going to go inside and give us a short talk about the um, about the house with PowerPoint slides. So that will come on your screen and be totally um, will be static. And then we're going to have a snooping set round the house session room by room with John on his iPad. So I hope I hope that works. Um, as I said, it's not something we've done before, but um, um, it, um, um, it it should be great. Anyway, um, and it's almost as hot here in London, I think, as it is in the California <laughs> deserts. Although I'm sure, I'm sure that will be denied by John. But um, 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 before before we, I finally hand over to him. I should just say, for, if there are any people there, um, viewers who aren't members of the 20th Century Society, I'd just very briefly like to say that what we're a building preservation organisation. We campaign for buildings from 1914 onwards. Um, and we're a charity and so although we're doing these online events and not charging for them normally we have a, a full um, real world events program which um, we do charge for and goes quite a long way to support our campaigning work so if you felt to make a donation towards that um, we would be really really grateful and as it says on the screen if you donate 10 pounds or more you could have one of these packs of greetings cards um, from um, our um, member John East's some pictures of India and Japan, which are lovely. Um, it, just if you if you would like greetings cards when you when you make a donation, just just put in the box that that, that you'd like us to send them out to you. And which one? Um, otherwise, we will be slightly mystified. Anyway, um, now um, um, over to John. I think John, do you want to <laughs> um, um, go full screen? Okay. So yes. now you're in the um, front yard and you're going to walk yes. out towards the road. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Palm Desert, California. Um, we're in the Coachella Valley, uh, just a few miles south of uh, Palm Springs. And I'll uh, flip my camera so you can see kind of a little better. Uh, the Miles C. Bates House in uh, Palm Desert which was uh, originally designed by Walter S. White and restored by our office, uh, Stainer Architects, over the past two years. Um, so you can see it's probably pretty different than it is in uh, London right now. The uh, temperature right now is about uh, 33 degrees Celsius and is going up to actually 44 today. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of the outside and the uh, native plantings that we have out here. So I'll uh, take you inside. <laughs> It'll be a little bit like a MTV crib, hopefully. Uh, but uh, let me share some uh, info on the house in there. OK. So we are now in the house. So that's just a quick glimpse before we do the PowerPoint bit, and then we'll come back to uh, the roving tour. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. How's that? So you can, everyone can see in here, I hope. Um, okay. So let me uh, share my screen and I'm going to just do a quick uh, kind of introduction to the house for all of you who may not be uh, super familiar with uh, the architect of the house, Walter S. White who is a Southern California architect and 
Um, he uh, built many projects in the Coachella Valley. He worked for um, uh, Albert Frey. Uh, he worked for uh, Richard Neutra's protege, um, uh, Harwell uh, Hamilton Harris, and has kind of a storied history in the Coachella Valley, but um, uh, may, you may not be familiar with him. So let me just uh, kind of do a, a brief introduction on uh, the house and uh, Walter S. Lee. Okay, so hopefully that works okay. Um, so here we are uh, in uh, Southern California and um, we're just two hours east of Los Angeles in the Coachella Valley. And um, if you kind of zoom in a little further, we're just about um, a 20 minute drive southwest uh, of Palm Springs, which maybe you're familiar with for all the kind of amazing mid-century architecture. Um, and we're just kind of north uh, west of uh, the, the Salton Sea and about uh, two, two hours drive uh, northeast of uh, San Diego. So we're uh, pretty centrally located for uh, Southern California and then within the Coachella Valley um, near maybe some markers that you are uh, familiar with like uh, Palm Springs and the Salton Sea. Um, so maybe just to give you a little bit of background about uh, Walter S. Light, um, he was a uh, Southern California uh, born uh, architect and really an inventor and kind of tinkerer who worked for uh, Schindler, as I was saying, Frey, um, uh, the protege of Nort, uh, and even uh, Douglas Aircraft, which is kind of uh, neat. And his uh, designs and his construction techniques, which uh, some of us were even uh, patented, like the wave, uh, the, the roller coaster roof of this house, um, they're very influential to the mid century architecture movement and um, its development. So these are a couple of houses by White in uh, Palm Springs, the Franz Alexander residence, and the Wilcoxon residence. Both of them are still actually in existence right now. Um, the, the Franz Alexander house uh, is in, in fairly good shape. The Wilcoxon house um, has, uh, um, has had the same owner for many years and is kind of just uh, petrified in, in time almost. Um, and, and so anyway, um, I guess the, the house is uh, called the Miles C. Bates house and the namesake of the house is uh, Miles C. Bates, um, who was uh, a client of Walter S. White's and worked with him over many years uh, as a collaborator um, on the design of several houses. And, and Bates was um, an artist and sculptor who was from a very wealthy Midwestern uh, family and kind of lived a carefree desert lifestyle, which is not very uncommon for uh, Palm Springs and the uh, greater Palm Springs area, like Palm Desert. And um, he was kind of most known for his artwork, but uh, his uh, kind of uh, presence in the nightlife and uh, social life of uh, uh, Palm Springs. Um, and so over the years, uh, White collaborated with Bates on several designs. And this is actually a rendering of the, uh, the, the Miles Bates house, the, the Wave house. Um, and, and this was really the only realized example of their collaboration, um, which uh, is kind of incredible that uh, you're inside of it right now. Um, and so, so the house was built in uh, 1950, it was designed in 1954 and it was ultimately constructed, constructed in 55. Um, and this is the kind of original rendering of the site plan and only the house was actually executed, not the, the rest of the, the property, like the reflecting pool and um, kind of all these uh, other nice site details, though um, I think we hope to uh, uh, construct some of them in the future um, in the development of the property. Um, and so here's a drawing uh, by Walter S. White uh, from the, the 50s, and just maybe so you can see it a little bit better, uh, our redrawing of it, um, with uh, essentially showing there's, it's really a tiny place of uh, 77 meters squared, um, 827 square feet. It has one bedroom, uh, two bathrooms, a kind of uh, living room, kitchen, uh, dining terrace, combined area that's very open and, and lovely. Um, and it, it's very uh, uh, a small place uh, to, to be in. Um, I guess the most notable kind of uh, feature of the house is the incredible roof line. And it's actually a patented system. Um, just uh, Walter S. White um, filed for a number of patents in his lifetime. And, and this one was actually um, given to him. Um, and so the roof is extremely uh, kind of experimental for its time. And, and really even today is kind of a precursor to um, dowel laminated timber and a lot of the different kind of mass construction uh, or mass timber construction that we're using today, especially coming from 
uh, Canada and um, kind of north of uh, the, the north uh, west of the United States. And these are just some images from the patent document, which show the construction of a roof, which was very much based in kind of natural systems and um, and really the entire roof line sits on these two blue laminated beams. Um, and, and so you can see the drawing from his original uh, drawing set here of those blue lamb beams. Um, and this is the construction of the roof in the 50s. Uh, you can see this kind of intricate network of uh, dowels and um, uh, uh, interlocking wood joinery, which kind of allowed for this curvature to take place. Um, some more construction images. Um, the, the material palette you'll see is extremely sparse um, of just concrete block, wood, um, glass, steel, and terrazzo for the floor. And you can see here that it was constructed in a citrus grove originally, um, since uh, citrus trees grow so kind of easily in this climate. It's um, kind of amazing and, and still do, um, and date palms and just a kind of uh, array of fruiting trees. Um, some more images of the construction of the house. And then this is kind of in uh, 1955, once it was constructed, and you can see the kind of amazing roof line hovering um, uh, above the concrete block. Some amazing details of the glass that, uh, that uh, butt into each other. And then, I mean, really, so some, a few images of the interior as it was built in 1955. Um, the, the space doubled as a studio for Miles Bates and under his ownership, the, the small house was kind of a hub of social activity for uh, Palm Desert and the Coachella Valley. And um, a number of uh, concerts and musical performances happened there. And um, it, it's, it, from what we understand, it was quite a, a special place. Um, so after its completion, um, this is a picture of the house in uh, 2018 um, when we uh, purchased the house. But um, af after the completion, um, Bates sold the house in uh, 1962, and a, a bunch of kind of additions happened in the uh, oh god the 60s and 70s, um, and they were kind of ill-advised. And the Palm Desert uh, Redevelopment Agency uh, purchased the property in 2007, and was not aware of the kind of incredible uh, history of the house because of all of the additions and. Uh, uh, renovations that happened on it. Um, so these are just some images of each of the elevations of the exterior, um, showing it how it was boarded up um, by the city just to protect it from um, uh, people staying in it, since there's, um, I, I guess, a homeless, uh, there, were, there were homeless people staying in it at one point. Um, and the, the Palm Desert Historical Society um, kind of helped the city to realize what they had in their possession. And um, uh, initiated the Save the Wave campaign, the just kind of after the, the name of the house, the, the Wave House, um, and the city put it up for um, auction in 2017 and uh, gave a $50,000 grant to the successful bidder. Um, so you can see just the, the kind of crazy condition that it was found in um, when we purchased it. Um, many of the, so this is the master bathroom, um, this is the bedroom, uh, many of the walls were continued up to the ceiling, even though they had originally been kept kind of just a few feet below it in order to show off the, the roof. Um, there was uh, new HVAC ductwork that was installed. Um, there were some traces of original materials that were underneath layers of ceramic tile or stucco, um, but oftentimes these uh, were uh, completely hidden from view and something that we kind of had to discover down the road um, in our process of rest restoring the house. Um, so, um, so we, we purchased the house in, uh, uh, in 2018 or 2017 and, and began the restoration in 2018, um, with the ultimate plan to, um, uh, restore the home and, uh, ultimately, um, create a publicly accessible amenity to Palm Desert and the Coachella Valley that, uh, could be used for artist residencies, educational tours, and events, and, um, and this is the first phase of the project, the, um, the restoration with the next phase to um, add to uh, dwelling units at the rear of the property, since it's a pretty uh, large property, and um, have it as kind of a, a larger space that people can uh, congregate eventually. Um, so uh, you're looking at an image of the restoration process of the roof line. Um, and, and I guess first and foremost, we should 
kind of clarify that the intent of all of the restoration work was to um, to revive the the work of Walter S. Light, sketches and drawings from the Walter S. Light archives um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, and and really tried to um, revive the roof construction and the methods that he was using there. So a huge emphasis was placed on the roof line and uh, maintaining its appearance while simultaneously strengthening it and you know protecting it from decay. Um, you're looking right now at a few details of the, um, the, the restoration efforts and, and one of the huge goals was to improve the, um, the efficiency, energy efficiency of the house. So at the peak of the house, you'll see there's five inches of insulation and then it tapers to just a few uh, millimeters at the end just so that no one can actually see that the roof is now much more efficient than it was, but um, you know, it will, will last much into the future. Um, many of the details were um, intensely scrutinized to, um, John, to, John, to I'm just going to just interrupt briefly I think you're touching your iPad and it's making funny noises oh okay um, I think um, that's what it is I'll, I'll wave when it makes a funny noise so that you can work out it is what you're doing what it is okay. that you're doing and stop it okay <laughs> how about now yeah and this drawing, I think, is great. I mean, you're going to talk us through this in, in a lot of detail because I think it, it's the most amazing kind of spine-like construction. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're, right now you're looking at um, the termination of the roof at the east side of the building. And you can see these um, two by four pieces of wood and these rods that essentially interlock to allow for the curving of the roof. So just that uh, rotation that happens very gradually around the, the rods allows for that curvature to happen. Um, there were so many things that um, went into the, the restoration process. Um, of the roof line and um, and really, um, I mean, part of it was kind of replacing the pieces that were completely rotten away, um, which you can kind of see in um, like an image like this, that some of the pieces had to be completely um, re replaced. And so we custom milled all of the different components there um, to, to perfectly match the design that uh, Walter S. White had originally created. But we also added um, a number of pieces like um, steel plates that um, were um, were uh, were placed at this connection here, so that it would be kind of reinforced. And when we purchased the property, it was kind of uh, bending further than a ninety degree angle, which was not part of the original design. And so uh, reinforcements like that that are kind of embedded in the structure and hidden below the roof material were uh, key in really just in ensuring that it will uh, last into the future. Um, I mean, we added straps along the uh, glue laminated beams to stiffen the entire roof structure so that it acts um, as it was kind of intended as a, um, as just like almost like a, a chip or like a potato chip or something like a, just a, a plate, a single uh, object. Um, so uh, let's see. I hope that didn't make the noise. Um, oh, that was good. Okay, good. Um, another huge uh, element of the restoration were all the sliding steel doors that uh, many of which had been uh, completely removed uh, and infilled with concrete block and um, we had to determine whether that was done for structural purposes and determine that it wasn't but um, it, it may have been for um, just increased uh, protection from the sun. Um, but we, we wanted to uh, certainly bring the, the steel openings back since they were so important to um, this kind of desert lifestyle uh, that's so indoor and outdoor. Um, so uh, many of the doors that were uh, missing, we used Walter S. White's original uh, details to guide us and used a custom fabricator in Los Angeles where our office is based to essentially replicate the uh, door detail. And so you can see here, um, this is a, a, essentially a Walter S. White's drawing that we redrew for the fabricator and um, essentially found all of the matching components as in, including like the um, sliding steel uh, rollers for the doors just so the um, screens and the doors can roll easily um, and, and really just uh, matching all of the dimensions um, so that it could slot right in essentially to the original openings and uh, function as it was meant to um, when Miles Bates was uh, uh, living in the house. Um, so this is for example the, um, the track of the sliding door at the fabricators uh, shop in Los Angeles, um, and some details of the installation of the, the sliding uh, doors. 
um, the, the fabricator in the space uh, working on the, the steel. Um, many, uh, I mean, there were additions that were built off the front of the house, and so many of these uh, openings had to be infilled, and so we tried to figure out the most kind of seamless way to essentially hide that um, there was any um, opening ever built there, and to this day, I mean, if you go and uh, see the house, you would almost never know that there's, um, there were two additions built on the front that had openings directly through, um, through the original uh, concrete wall. Um, and the paint, obviously, the color was so important to get right in all of the finishes. And um, the, the, the blue is just so important. We found several examples of that original blue around the property that were hidden by um, the addition or hidden by a drop ceiling. And so um, we came up with a custom version that kind of was a, an amalgamation of them, essentially, that um, considered each of the different uh, uh, colors that were part of that original family of maybe four or five different blues, really. Um, and the, the ceiling, which similarly had several areas that were original um, and just hidden kind of amidst the restoration or renovation work over um, the, the 1960s and, and 70s, um, the, the ceiling had been sandblasted and painted and much of the paint had seeped into the roof line, um, which prevented it from ever being removed. So we um, kept any location that was um, with the original stain and devised essentially a, um, a, a treatment for all of the other uh, painted locations that would match it very nicely, um, while still kind of um, uh, incorporating it into like a quilt light network really of just a uh, ceiling. So when you come to the house today, um, it it's kind of appears almost like a, a quilt of just the original components and the pieces that we've um, uh, treated with the, with the matching stain. Um, the terrazzo floor, which was uh, another huge uh, component of the original design that we were able to restore. And um, wherever any infilling of terrazzo needed to be done, we were able to uh, source the material from the original quarry that it was, um, it was, it was pulled from since it's still open. Um, the glazing was similarly a, a huge, uh, hugely important part of the restoration. Um, in order to keep the original sliding steel doors that were there, um, just the same as they were. We weren't able to use, you know, a double insulated piece of glass or uh, thicker glass, but we were able to use higher performing glass and, um, and simultaneously uh, try to uh, do a number of other additions that would um, work on the energy efficiency of the house, like a, um, an automated curtain system, for example, that you'll see in some of the later pictures to uh, protect it from the sun. And so these are some kind of neat details that where the roof comes down in the bedroom and there's a tiny, tiny piece of glass that uh, slots into um, uh, the roof. And, and a lot of the details are really neat and unique to Walter S. White and really incorporate the roof line. And um, many of the pieces of glass slot directly into the roof, which was something kind of neat to find out. Um, just you, uh, in the process of restoring the house, we, we noticed all of these grooves in the roof line and realized that uh, they were actually just the stop for the, the piece of the glass. Um, so this is in the bedroom and uh, I'll, I'll show you this kind of incredible planter uh, when we walk around, but this is where the roof line kind of terminates and um, uh, finishes with this incredible cantilevering planter, which was kind of a funny uh, flourish that uh, Walter S. White designed. Um, a, a number of tiles that we added to the house. Uh, these are heat ceramic tiles that are from uh, Northern California and uh, kind of a period appropriate uh, introduction of material that we, we did uh, to the house. Um, we, we added a Italian glass tile that uh, perfectly matches the original tile that was in the bathroom and um, something that we discovered in there. Um, the uh, garden in the front of the house that you saw is another kind of uh, neat feature. Um, and we worked with a, a landscape, or really a, a, a cactus, uh, a, just really a guru in uh, Los Angeles to, um, to source all of the cactuses um, locally in the Coachella Valley and the uh, Mojave Desert Land Trust, which is, um, they have a native plant nursery where we source the majority of our plants from. So many of these are um, kind of bringing the landscape back to what it was in, in the 50s, really in the front of the house. Um, okay, 
DC if you want. Um, so in, in 2020, um, two years after we, we purchased the house, um, this is when the, the building was uh, kind of publicly unveiled during uh, Modernism Week. And uh, I'm not sure if you're very familiar with Modernism Week, but it draws a humongous amount of people to the Coachella Valley. And um, I think 900 people toured the house over the course of three days um, after its completion, which is uh, kind of amazing because you'll see it's very tiny. Um, so here's some images just of before and after uh, the various spaces that you've kind of seen so far. Um, the kitchen, living room, bedroom. Uh, you can see the kind of uh, drop ceiling that was installed and so anywhere that was um, uh, built up to the ceiling, we removed and uh, replaced it with glass as it was originally and really creates this amazing sense of the roof uh, levitating above you everywhere. Um, this is the detail of the corner of the house that I'll show you that uh, Catherine mentioned, um, which was completely kind of uh, rotten away and, um, and we were able to, to restore. The bedroom and the master bathroom um, which was one of the openings that had been completely infilled on the right side um, uh, of the bedroom and be replaced with uh, steel as it was. The bedroom. Um, yeah, and I mean, our office um, the, approached the restoration with this idea that historic preservation is not just about turning back the clock to um, a time past and and really producing this condition where, uh, where the house can exist across multiple time periods and a visitor can essentially exist both contemporarily and in uh, a previous time period like Miles Bates did. And that's really the sense that you get when you're at the house. And so um, we tried to incorporate all of these kind of existing kind of scars or features of the house, like the uh, original uh, roof or um, the original finishes. Um, and we're careful to avoid kind of museumifying the house um, that would be frozen in time. Um, we, we tried to create the desert landscape, the ambient sounds, the smells and textures and all of these other features of the house that are so much important to the experience of it in addition to just the kind of visual um, restoration of the house. The kitchen. Uh, this is the master bathroom which creates this sense of kind of uh, being both inside and outside. And you can uh, take a look on, look at that on, when I walk around. Um, a few detail shots. Um, and our approach to the, the um, revitalization kind of of the structure was very much programmatically driven in that um, you know, most of these houses that are privately owned, uh, restored homes from the mid-century are um, privately owned and used only by an exclusive few. And we, from the beginning, just sought to um, use the purchase essentially to create a publicly accessible amenity to uh, Palm Desert and um, the greater Coachella Valley, much as the way the house originally was a hub of social and creative activity there. So that is my last slide. Um, perhaps we can either see if there are any questions or... Um... a few questions. Shall I put some of the questions to you at this point? Sure. Um, now, where are we? Um, somebody wanted to know whether you could estimate what sort of percentage of the original fabric you were able to keep and what, what you need to replace, which... Um, That's a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I would almost have to go through each material really or just kind of each yeah. feature and, and kind of I think, you, um, I think that would be really interesting yeah yeah I mean for example um, the, the wood paneling which you'll see is um, one thing that was completely uh, mummified really under stucco and uh, paint and had been completely preserved which is um, something we didn't expect at all we had seen photographs of the it's it's white ash American white ash and it was preserved perfectly under the um, under the uh, layers of just stuff people had added over time. And so, so was that a veneer or is it a solid panel? It's a solid panel. Of, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. It's, it's a veneer. Um, right. the, I thought you meant the solid uh, uh, 
uh, treatment that was put on top of it. That was like a yeah. piece of uh, drywall that was often put on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's but it, it's a veneer piece of wood. Life under all that, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I would say so. Then for the white ash, for example, that maybe seventy five percent of it is original. Um, so it, it, I mean, really a lot. Um, probably ninety five percent of the trosso floor is original, and um, at the kind of borderline of the floor. A lot of it had been damaged when the sliding steel doors were removed in the 1960s and 70s. And so we added a border, again, that was just a matching terrazzo, essentially, almost indiscernible from the original terrazzo. But I'd say about 5% of the terrazzo is new. Um, and the roof line, for example, so much of it was in amazing shape, but at the edges was kind of rotten away. So maybe 95% uh, of the roof is original. So, I mean, really quite a lot. So you were splicing in the end dowels onto the end of... of Correct. Well, the whole Correct. Um, there were very... away at the edges. Yes. I mean, because the water... I mean, it, it rains so infrequently here, but in the... Um, in certain periods of the year, it, it does rain, and it's really quite uh, heavy. And, and so just the water uh, coming off of the roof line, just dripping and um, having absolutely no kind of protection from uh, water seeping off the edge, just rotted it away over, I mean, it's, uh, it's lifetime. So really just slotting in pieces at the edge, um, a few at the middle where water had pooled over time, um, just with poor drainage. So there, there were a few places that um, new pieces were, were put in, but really it was kind of like a, uh, incision than a you know completely removing uh, chunks. Can I ask a question of my own, which sort of follows on from that? In that, I mean, we've seen a lot of incredibly um, clean and simple and lovely details, um, but not ones you could um, remotely get away with in a British climate. Um, mm. Have you made any changes to those details? And in in terms of the longevity of the building going forward do you think you know if you if you show up after a major storm and tidy up do you think that will help with preventing rot in the future so one i mean uh walter s white never included for example like a a piece of material or a metal uh just drip protector essentially right. like a, just uh i mean at where gutters or i mean really any of that so we did add certain uh, elements like that just um so that the water could flow kind of more easily off the roof line. And um, I mean, the, the actual insulation on the roof, we um, routed water so it would flow to only certain locations versus um, when it was originally designed, the, the roof was just um, completely uniform in its distribution of um, uh, any material. Though, I mean, really there was no insulation on top of the roof. It was like a yeah. mixture of cementos um, and maybe a, a roofing paper. Um, but the insulation that we added to the roof line now directs water to only go in certain locations. And it, I mean, it works perfectly. Um, That's interesting. So you've used the, the slopes that you've been able to create within the insulation to do that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, really that insulation is doing a lot, uh, yeah. more than just insulating it really. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's justifying its existence more and more as you describe that. Um, the, we, somebody wanted to know what company did the um, doors and windows. I'm sorry, I can't get back into chat. To, I'm trying to remember what everyone's asked. So I can't tell you whose question that was. Yeah. Um, hopefully they're still out there and would like to know the answer. Yeah, uh, well, if they're based in Los Angeles, they might know of them, but it's a, a, a fabricator called Conant Moran, and we've worked with them on a number of our uh, projects in Los Angeles, and this was the first um, historic preservation or restoration type project that we worked on with them. Um, but they had done a number of doors for us that were, I mean, quite beautiful. And they are, I mean, absolute craftsmen. So um, we, we asked them to, to do the doors for us since we knew they could replicate the detail perfectly and with like a real quality of work. Lovely. And then there are obviously quite a lot of people who are really, really keen to come and see the house and want to know whether it's available for short-term rentals and whether the artist in residence program has started yet. So yeah. I've, I've told them that not much is happening because of COVID at the moment, but do you want to tell us what's happening in the future? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, a, a big part of the restoration process was working with the city of Palm Desert to essentially allow the property, which is a residentially zoned property, to um, to host short-term rentals and to host 
um, events and uh, essentially allow people to be on the house for purposes other than just uh, living here and, and owning the house. Um, and we worked with the city to get a conditional use permit so that we could have overnight stays and uh, all of these uses. So it was a really kind of neat um, public private partnership really um, where we um, just worked very intimately with the city and ultimately got the uh, conditional use permit. So now um, the house uh, actually starting next week and we have our first overnight reservations next week. Um, we'll have um, short-term rentals and um, overnight stays in the fall will, um, uh, depending I guess how things are really just um, consider opening it for small events and family gatherings, but really just in the um, period that's kind of upcoming, um, we've designed just a, a kind of system of intensive <laughs> cleaning and just a really rigorous process so that uh, essentially people can come here and still experience the house. Um, so it, it is um, being used for overnight stays and um, it, yeah, it, it's being used for kind of what we intend is. Well, maybe you could send us the, the um, contact details and we can put them up on, on the website at the, at the end of this. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no. So we've also got, um, is there a drainage system or is that not required in the desert? Sure. Uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, component of the house, just the what was required of us. And since yeah. it's a historic home, we were not required to um, update a lot of the house to current standards, which would have really just destroyed uh, the house. And, and even the, the current city standards of uh, having covered parking and all of these things, we were able to um, request exemptions from because of this historic condition. So, I mean, really, we, we, we should have been required to put a carport in the front yard, which would have completely destroyed the um, amazing view of the house. Um, and so, um, I mean, things like the, the drainage and things like that are, are not um, really required beyond what was actually there, um, just in order to um, meet the, any requirements we were, were asked to follow. Um, if, if that answered the question or maybe yeah, no, just... I mean you obviously had the city very much on board right from the beginning and I mean was that the you said there was a it gave a grant towards the restoration was that contingent on you allowing some public access or sure yeah. so I, I think one of the other bidders we were up against during this auction uh, which actually happened during modernism week um, was was going to maybe even redevelop the, the property. Um, and the city was giving $50,000 um, for anyone who would, I think, put uh, about $100,000 into the house towards restoring it. So that was the kind of stipulation of uh, using that money. Um, and we certainly <laughs> did. Yes, I'm sure you spent a lot more than that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and then finally, two questions. One, one was the roof line designed to mimic the mountain in the background? Did, um, did the architect write about that at all? There, there are a few kind of rumors about the roof line, one of which is that it mimics the mountain lines in the distance. Um, another, that it's perfectly calibrated in plan uh, in order to uh, block the sun from entering the house right. um, during the the highest kind of uh, uh, point of the day or just different portions of the day because in plan the roof line kind of curves around and um, I have not read anything that conclusively um, says that the mountains uh, follow the roof line or vice versa um, and I think it's a really nice poetic way to think about it and it and when you're there it absolutely happens and I would love to think that maybe what Walter S. White was thinking about that um, it, it really does feel very connected with the mountains behind it. So I haven't read anything that says that, but it certainly seems like it. Um, and the way the roof was designed to block sun, um, in the summer when the sun is very high, it absolutely uh, blocks the sun. So the, in the living room, for example, throughout the day until the very end when the sun is very low, it, it completely blocks all sun. So it's really um, doing quite a lot of work. And, and what about the, the extra structures you're going to put onto the site? Um, someone is asking whether they're going to be in the same style or the same materials or, or something totally different. Sure. Um, so those, essentially, it will be two um, dwelling units. 
and a pool and a small structure that will have a catering kitchen and a public bathroom and essentially together the the complex of buildings will allow for um, people to host events and uh, gatherings at the property and rent for a larger group of people for like a conference or things like that um, and so um, the the buildings will be pushed as far away from the house on the lot so that the house can kind of sit on its own and really stand um, alone. Um, the design of the roof line um, for those buildings will be flat and really defer to the kind of exuberance of the uh, roof line of the wave house. Um, mm -hmm. Though I think in terms of material and construction methods, we're trying to really um, consider Walter S. White's design. And so we've been um, working with um, different ideas for uh, the roof using dowel laminated uh, construction, much in the way that uh, Walter S. White is doing it, but in a flat roof. And there are a number of um, companies in British Columbia that um, we've been in touch with about just the, the potential construction of the roof line. Um, and then the, I guess something when you're here and you experience it that's kind of amazing is that the um, solid walls, uh, they all end at six feet, 10 inches in height. And so above that, it's all glass and steel. And so similarly in our design, all of the solid walls will maintain that data line. Yeah. Um, so there are, I mean, a number of things in terms of material construction and, um, and really just the positioning of these buildings on the site yeah. that we're trying to um, both relate and be extremely sensitive to yeah. the design. Is it going to be possible to reinstate that amazing circle of planting that put on the, one of the drawings you showed? Yeah, so we, we've actually designed the driveway of the house so that it um, kind of reinstates that circular loop um, of entrance that, uh, whether it was ever really executed, it's yeah, kind of hard to tell. Yeah. Um, but we have done that and we're, um, in terms of the, the pool that we're going to build, we're trying to have it located and designed in a way that it's much like the reflecting pond that Walter S. White originally um, designed for the, the property, but never actually executed. Um, so I, I think in terms of the site plan, we, we'd like it to be kind of um, considerate of what Walter S. White was, was trying to do. Certainly now it's a rectangular shaped lot and um, has been completely changed from when uh, it was just a citrus grove, but um, whatever we can kind of within that uh, confine. Okay, well, do you want to start your tour then? Um, Absolutely. Yes. And I think if anyone has questions along the way and um, I can talk specifically about anything, I'd, I'd be more right. than happy to, really. Um, okay. Okay. Yes, let's start. This is now you are in the living room of the house and you can see kind of in the distance um, the amazing mountains and the view that you have over there and the roof line um, i guess all of the furniture um, or really quite a lot of it is from uh, this the stainer family collection of uh, furniture vintage uh, 1950s and uh, period furniture and we reupholstered it with um, Tybor fabric, which is a kind of neat connection to the UK that um, that we have in the project. And so um, all of the curtains, for example, in the living room are made with uh, Tybor fabric. And um, I, I was talking to Catherine and incidentally, the house that um, Tybor Reich designed for his family is built just a year, uh, uh, I think after the, the, the Miles Bates house was. So there is this kind of funny connection in, um, in the fabric and um, all of the upholstery, we tried to um, uh, kind of uh, be sensitive to that connection. Um, so here is the kitchen. Um, and similarly, um, with just trying to maintain this kind of period uh, uh, relationship, we have a bunch of uh, uh, Russell Ware uh, uh, dishes and things of the kind of period, which is kind of neat. Um, we're still in the kitchen, and this is a, a wall of uh, Heath ceramic tile, which I was mentioning before, but from uh, Sausalito, California, in Northern California. Here in telephone, you missed that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, 
vintage uh, Bell telephone, uh, make a call on there, see what happens. Um, yeah, so I mean, really just all of the, the pieces in here are just meant to be sensitive to the time, but kind of updated with uh, some of these uh, new prints, which are actually um, uh, pulled from the archives of Tybor that, and to be recreated, essentially. Um, maybe while we're here, we can go just outside to the yard for the um, living room. And is it the same terrazzo that spreads out from inside to outside? Yes, and that's kind of one of the really yeah. neat things um, just about experiencing the house, um, that there's absolutely this sense of being inside and outside um, when you're there. So you can see kind of the uh, floor continues perfectly uh, just outside. And you can see in the distance these kind of incredible uh, mountains. So now we're in the uh, backyard of the house, uh, looking north. We'll take a lap back in the living room, if we are able. <laughs> And those projecting um, elements on that wall, are they just decorative or is that, is there something else going on there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that is a kind of funny detail that Walter S. White had in the building and creates this kind of sensation of the wall um, continuing inside and outside. So the blocks continue outside um, and um, just travel in words, which is kind of neat. Um, and it's just kind of a funny flourish that he designed for the house, similar to the, the planter, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, Somebody's asking about, um, did you have to retrofit the, air, the residence with aircon? Um, I think I remember you saying it did have aircon from the start, is that right? <laughs> yes, um, so it always had air conditioning um, and it has, and I'll actually show you, um, it has an underground uh, network of uh, ducts that um, Walter S. White designed for the house to pre-cool the air, which is kind of, uh, at the time, very unique. And so here, I mean, this is kind of a not very nice uh, detail, but essentially there are these openings in the ground that were used to draw air into the uh, mechanical uh, core of the house, which is um, this room here, kind of just when you walk in and you can see it's this kind of solid object in the center of the house. And we have uh, utilized the, the, the underground ductwork that run essentially a very efficient uh, HVAC uh, aircon system basically inside of it. So we've used the same space of it, but um, with a system that is, I mean, for its, even for today, extremely kind of efficient. Um, so here, now we're in the bedroom, and I'm actually standing outside, but there's uh, obviously this kind of amazing indoor and outdoor quality of the whole house. Um, and here is this kind of amazing uh, uh, detail that I think you saw maybe in the presentation, but where the uh, roof line comes down to the ground and uh, kind of is buttressed into the ground and we have this planter here that um, at the time was completely uh, sunk in and destroyed and we've actually uh, reconstructed the planter kind of perfectly to the dimensions um, that it was designed in. Um, although actually the um, steel structure that supports the cantilever was in place when we um, kind of disassembled the broken pieces of it. Uh, so we were able to use um, really just the, the buttress and the uh, steel structure that were original to the design. Um, this is that uh, kind of roof corner. And I mean, another location that the dowels had to be slotted in and out of the uh, construction due to all the kind of rot from water. The minimal amount of water that you have in the desert still can do quite a bit of damage. Um, and so you can see um, just that construction. Mm. 
Um, and then this is again reinforced with uh, pieces of steel brackets that essentially keep that uh, amazing 90 degree angle in place. And is the, is the timber stained? Yeah, it looks like quite sort of strong colour. Uh, there, there, there's another question here about specifically about concrete about the colours, saying is there a specific reason? This is from Jade. Why the concrete Jade. wall um, goes from blue from white to orange as it goes to the outside? Um, sure, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, the the roof, the entire construction is the same uh, stain colour. Yeah. So the it's, it's probably impossible to tell over Zoom, but here above the core of the house, which is really just enclosed by glass and this um, uh, screen, um, that's one of the only locations that had the original stain in place. And that was because if you remember the picture of the bedroom, there was a drop ceiling that was installed here for uh, HVAC to run um, to, to further uh, cool the house and the additions to the house. And so uh, it kind of protected it uh, and preserved it. And so this is kind of just another uh, neat moment in the house where um, the walls continue both inside and outside. And so this is the main wall of the bedroom, but it continues to this outside um, with a kind of sh a, a short wall essentially that um, encloses the bathroom. And we've designed this um, screen essentially um, to you'll see in a second. Design this screen so that um, it, it follows a design that Walter White had originally um, rendered for the, the, the house and to create privacy for the bathroom that kind of uh, jolts outside of the house but um, was never actually edited. We just know that it was kind of rendered in wood. Um, and then the sensation that you get when you're there is this kind of amazing, um, you know, this is actually a shower and yet you're uh, completely outside in a cactus garden. <laughs> and I mean, a number of the kind of components of the original infrastructure were in place, like this Prin uh, blow fan that we uh, were just able to replay, but um, you know, uh, was still able to, to have it working. Uh, the, the bathroom with um, a number of just the original uh, pieces, like the countertop is all original and something kind of funny that Walter S. White had were these incredible shaped counters. Um, so you can see that there, which is a very uh, kind of 1950s look. Um, any sinks and spaces that um, we changed, we, we used material, so stainless steel, to kind of introduce um, that we were doing something there and not uh, using the original, uh, what was maybe there. There was actually a cracked uh, sink that was in that position. So we're back in the bedroom. And it's very small. I mean, there's one bedroom, two bathrooms. I can quickly show you that one. Uh, that's nothing crazy. So here's the uh, other bathroom. And you can see this kind of amazing uh, glass ceiling that um, allows light in the bathroom. Um, some kind of uh, funny uh, vintage crane Elaine uh, sink. Um, which was originally in the bathroom. And now we're back already. <laughs> Let me move. Yeah. Do I have any other questions or anything about it? Um, another query about the, the, the stunning floor in the living room, which, I, so that's the terrazzo, isn't it? Can you yes, say again where the terrazzo came from? Yeah, and, and so this is the kind of border of the terrazzo, um, which we introduced to um, the, so where it was still below the line and, and new above the line. Yes, yeah. um, so we, we, we matched it kind of as uh, perfectly as we could with the, the same aggregate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's all the original uh, terrazzo floor except for this border, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, can I try? How's that? <laughs> We're seeing various bits of your anatomy at the moment. I, I think we've had an excellent, fantastic tour. But we've got more messages on, um, on. Oops. I think we have about five minutes until it's 11. Or, uh, 7.
seven thirty your time. Yes. Um, no, I think. Um, I mean, I think you've given us an, an excellent um, explanation of, of, the, of the work that was needed, um, and um, the vision that it obviously took to realise that. Uh, and um, and we're probably all wishing that we could um, jump on an aeroplane and um, spend some time in the desert. It just does. It looks so wonderful, and um, and it's so so lovely to see a building that was looking in such a sad shape. Um, and it's really, really um, doing exactly what it's meant to do again and looking, looking just so simple and crisp. And um, um, I think getting, getting the balance right between overdoing a restoration and um, um, repair, replacing too much of the original fabric is, is so difficult. Once you start on picking something as fragile as this, it's very, very easy to end up putting far too much in the skip. And I, I really am impressed that um, you've managed to avoid doing that. So um, I think thank you very very much and um, yes and thank you so much to you the, the society um, and just everyone for watching I mean it's so neat to be able to share this house with uh, an audience so far away but yes um, but but I mean mm -hmm. it's been a very bizarre event in many ways but very very enjoyable <laughs> yes um, so thank you and um, we hope we will be back at 6.30 next week. We're still finalising our programme, but please do check the website. And um, we hope to bring you um, a variety of talks and tours this regular slot each week while we're all still in lockdown. So thank you. Thank cool. you, John. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Catherine. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>